Um, well, I love the DSS uh, cheering squad over here. That's the fun. I don't get that often. Um, but I also want to tell you guys, you know, I've been here for about two hours, and uh, I am totally drinking the Martin's Belvedere County Kool-Aid. Cool it is, I mean, really, this is uh, super energizing. I, I love the comment by the young lady over here who was like, I'm so proud of my community. And having been in Richmond for about 22 years and watching some similar, you know, arc of development, um, like the pieces are here. You know, I, I my first trip to Martinsville um, was about a month and a half ago. I actually came to visit the local Department of Social Services here. And um, I just, you know, it was it was really beautiful, right? The rolling hills, the, the quaintness of uptown. Uh, like there's so many incredible pieces here and then to be in this room of all of the movers and shakers in this community and to see the, the coalescing of vision, uh, like that's really inspiring. So I hope you all are as proud of yourselves as, as the woman over here was earlier. Um, I have spent, you know, we're, we're going to talk a little day today about uh, building community connections. You know, we, we talked a lot about kind of business and housing, um, but there's this piece of just like real people on people, relationship on relationship, that is really vital to communities moving forward together. Um, and I've, I've spent a lot of my life thinking about how to form community um, and, and what that, uh, you know, what goes into forming community. Uh, I, I, as I was thinking about why that is, um, you know, I, my, I was born in India. Uh, my family immigrated here when I was about a year of age. Uh, we moved around a lot. I went to five different elementary schools before uh, my family ended up settling here in Virginia. Um, and then, you know, kind of just growing up was always a relative outsider, you know? As uh, an Indian moving in predominantly non-Indian spaces, always figuring out how to navigate, how to connect, how do I find uh, people and place and, and belonging. Um, and, and I'll say that this search for community and belonging uh, kind of took a different uh, level of intentionality when I met these guys. Um, I know this looks like a middle school slumber party, but these are actually grown men. Uh, these, are, <laughs> these are my roommates from college. Uh, and this was in college, so not really grown men. But, but uh, uh, we were all at the University of Virginia together, and I, I just, I mean, it was a group of really uh, incredible, fun-loving guys who, uh, I think in you know three years of living together, we <laughs> came to really know each other well, care for each other well. Um, we had a depth of friendship that I don't think a lot of young men in particular get to experience, um, and a sense of, of shared mission as we were operating in and around the university community. Um, and, and college, really, I mean, it was just an incredible time of growth and maturation for us. Uh, I know you probably don't believe that. Here's a picture of us throwing axes at one another. Um, but, but it really, I mean, like, PBA just, it was a beautiful place and uh, incredible professors, incredible investment in the student body. And so intellectually, socially, spiritually, uh, it was really a time of, of pretty remarkable growth for our group of friends. Um, and, and I think that, you know, many of us had grown, most of my group of friends had grown up in predominantly white, predominantly upper middle class communities around the country. Uh, some of us had gone to private schools, some of us had gone to boarding schools. Um, and so largely, this group of friends had been pretty sheltered from real conversations about race and class and the reality of those issues here in, in the US. And, uh, but I will say, being at college, at UVA in the late 90s, we were about 10%, the student body was about 10% African American. Um, and while that wasn't a huge number, it was still like big enough to see those race and class dynamics actually playing out. So I just vividly remember as a new college student going into the dining hall and there being sort of the section where the black students kind of went and had lunch together. And there was uh, parts of the, the, the grounds where uh, upper level African American students would go uh, and, and self-select into housing because it's where they found community and connection. Uh, we had this bus stop in the middle of grounds that uh, it's weird to think about, but like everybody knew it as the black bus stop. That was just what it was called, BBS, black bus stop. And I was thinking about this a couple of years ago. I was like, did we really call it that? And I Googled it to like check myself, and there was actually a, an article that Virginia Magazine um, wrote about the history of the black bus stop. And, um, just, I mean, and, and in a positive way, like for black students, it was a place of connection, a place of refuge. 
Uh, but I think for me, not having a lot of exposure to those dynamics, I didn't know what to do with that. Um, and as a person of faith in college, I think uh, I was also confused by uh, the fact that we had like, you know, off grounds, we had like the black church and the white church. And on grounds in, in the faith community, you had like the white fellowship and the Asian fellowship and the black fellowship. And so like all of these things were just like coming into my consciousness and, uh, and you know, I, I had to kind of figure out what, what does this mean? What do we do about this? And, and I think our group of friends was, do, was on that journey together. Um, and so one of the things that grew out of the question asking and learning and trying to understand society um, led to an alternative spring break trip. Uh, somehow one of my roommates had gotten connected with a guy named John Perkins. Uh, Dr. Perkins was a pastor, a civil rights leader down in Jackson, Mississippi, um, and had really devoted his life to racial healing and racial reconciliation. And so he and his organization, Voice of Calvary, agreed to host college students for a spring break trip, where students would come from all over the country um, and they would serve together. And so uh, our group of friends rallied and, and just got about you know, 25 to 30 UVA students to go and do this trip together and very intentionally selected people from uh, these different corners of university life. Uh, and it was a really profound experience for them. And I should, I should caveat, I actually never went on a trip. I was too busy doing dumb stuff, like trying to get into med school, while uh, my friends and my, the woman who eventually became my wife were, were spending really meaningful time down in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, and then coming back to Charlottesville and, and watching the spillover that, of that in the university community and uh, the, the power of a group of 25 students of all different races who had served together for a week, built relationship with one another, and then to see that play out in, in life at, at UVA, uh, it was a really powerful ripple, ripple effect. So, you know, those experiences, those realities, like these were all a part of our coming of age, uh, our growth as you know, social beings, our understanding of justice, uh, our spiritual maturation, um, our intellectual and academic pursuits, all of that kind of found some connection in Dr. Martin Luther King's uh, concept of the beloved community. And I want to read this quote to you, because uh, no talk about community and race uh, can ever happen without a quote from Dr. King. But, but the end is reconciliation. The end is redemption. The end is the creation of the beloved community. It's this type of spirit and this type of love that can transform opposers into friends. It is this type of understanding goodwill that will transform the deep gloom of the old age into the exuberant gladness of the new age. It is this love which will bring about the miracles in the hearts of men. And so it was this vision of the beloved community that we were introduced to in college and kind of percolated for years that ultimately led several years later to several of my roommates and our wives making an intentional decision to move into a predominantly low-income, predominantly African-American community uh, in the east end of Richmond. Um, this is what much of the neighborhood looked like at the time that we moved in. It was just a lot of, a lot of boarded up houses, not a lot of disinvestment that had really happened since uh, you know, Brown versus Board of Education and white flight out, out of the city. Uh, and, and so the neighborhood had just progressively uh, come to disrepair. I imagine there are communities in Montana kind of that, that feel similar, or at least did in, in recent history. Um, my mother-in-law, I will say, was not a huge fan of me at, during this decision-making process. I don't think the, um, the vision of the beloved community was anything she was interested in, and certainly not having her daughter move into this community. Um, and we were, you know, frankly, like super out of place, right? My, thankfully, my wife uh, took a job at the school in this neighborhood, and so we had kind of an anchor and a connection and a reason to be there. Um, but every day was a reminder of, of us not really belonging. There's one particular story. Um, we were, it was move-in day for one of my college roommates. They, they bought a house across the street, and so they were moving in. Um, we had another one of our roommates, a guy named Peter, who uh, grew up at a boarding school in Connecticut. And so you can start to envision what kind of guy this is. Um, he actually now runs a boarding school, so if that helps anymore. So he rolls up in this like, 
pink polo with khaki shorts and one of those belts with like crawfish or lobster on it. <laughs> and so like really just like a sore thumb. And he introduces himself to the neighbor and he said, hi, my name's Peter, what's your name? And he, and he puts his hand out and the guy grabs his hand and, and he gives him a head nod and says, T-yo. And Peter says, T-yo? And he goes, no, T-yo. And Peter says, sorry, T-yo? Like you've gotten the, ac like the accent on the wrong syllable, right? And, and the guy starts to get a little agitated. He goes, no, T as in Thomas, yo as in the figure of speech. <laughs> and it was just this reminder to us of like, man, we got a lot to learn, right? Like literally a new language and dialect but also a new way of being, a new custom, a new way of connecting with people. And this, you know, the longer we lived there, this is 18 years ago now, we found more and more ways to, to learn that language and learn that way of being and to become a part of this community. Um, this happened a lot with the kids in the community, partly because my wife was a teacher and, and continues to teach at the elementary school in our neighborhood. Um, this is a picture of uh, Daquan and Buckshot, uh, two of our dear friends who, they lived in the house behind us whose alley backed up to us, um, and our dog Jackson. And uh, there's a, they would just be in the house all the time. So this, I was a pediatric resident at the time. Um, so working long hours and, and the kids would just come and go. They just felt so comfortable being a part of our extended family. Uh, and one day, I was, I'd come home from an overnight call, I'd fallen asleep on the couch, um, and I wake up to this like hot breath on my face. <laughs> and I, I open my eyes, and this little boy is nose to nose with me, and he's stroking my hair. <laughs> I said, Daquan, what are you doing? And he said, I like your hair. <laughs> your hair reminds me of Jackie Chan. <laughs> and it, it was such a like, moment because I was like, man, he's just never met anybody Indian, you know? And, and so that was such a like meaningful moment of connection to him. And then reflecting on that more, I was like, you know what? I have also never had this kind of relationship with a 10-year-old black child, you know? I've never had like the day-to-day -day, uh, interaction and connection and uh, you know, over time, like, I learned so much from my relationship with Daquan. I learned, you know, what it was like, you know, the part that I could see, what it was like to grow up, grow up without a father in the house. Uh, I could see the challenge of a kid with learning disabilities hating school and really not wanting to be there. Uh, I could see just the angst of not having regular food on the table. It's part of why he spent a lot of time in my house. Uh, and so all of these realities of Daquan's life uh, open my eyes to what what what's like to live in poverty and what it is that my neighbors are going through, um, and that gave me a, sort of a different understanding, a different sense of connection, a different way of grieving for my friends and my neighbors in my community, uh, and and I'm so grateful for that connection and relationship to Daquan. A couple other examples of this, you know, over the last few years, there's been a lot of refugee resettlement in the city of Richmond. Um, and so there was about a three year period right before the pandemic and leading into the pandemic, um, where this incredible family from the Democratic Republic of Congo uh, was settled about a block from my house. One of the kids was in my wife's class, one of the kids was in uh, my youngest daughter's class, and so we had all of these connections to the family. Um, I was constantly trying to help this family who speak any English, try to figure out how to get health services, how to sign up for Medicaid, how to get their resources from the social services department. And it was super hard, right? Like trying, not, not just because of language barrier, because like navigating all those systems, even if you spoke great English, was really challenging. And so, uh, but these guys were a part of our daily lives for the better part of three years. And again, that connection, that relationship, the love and community that we had together, uh, it, it, it changed us, it changed who we were. And then lastly, this, um, this young woman here, uh, Arjuna, showed up on our door at the age of, I don't know, 13, 14. She had been visiting her grandfather every weekend uh, her grandfather lived two blocks from us. Um, we moved from one house to uh, a, a larger house about two blocks away that we had renovated because we had had four kids at that point. 
Um, and so she had watched this house go up. She had watched the renovation take place over the course of the year. And so about a week or two after we moved in, she knocks on the door and she said, hey, can I see your house? Um, and that was the beginning of a, a really beautiful connection between our and initially my wife, and then, and then subsequently our whole family. Um, and then when things started to unravel and implode in her own family life, she'd experienced a lot of trauma even up to that point. Um, she came to us and said, hey, I just need a stable family. Can you guys do that? Um, and so she started living with us. And uh, a couple years later, she, she became formally a part of our family. This is her on our gotcha day when we adopted her. Um, and so the, the reality of us being in this place, being open to and proximal to people who are different than us, uh, has birthed deep connection that has made all of us more whole people. Uh, I'm gonna take a moment of, of dad pride here. Um, this is back in May, Arjuna, after a lot of stops and starts, walked across the stage at Community College. She graduated from Piedmont Community College in Charlottesville. Um, and school was real tough for her. She got expelled four different times in middle and high school. Um, but through her persistence, through her uh, getting really good trauma healing therapy by a therapist that, that we found, uh, by her getting on medications, by her uh, having a stable family, uh, she was able to, uh, you know, something, something clicked and she was able to, to achieve this huge accomplishment. Um, and then she got into every four-year school that she applied to as a transfer and started uh, this August at UVA, which just like, two <laughs> UVA parents is just another one. Um, and so all of these experiences have really embedded in me this, this heart for a concept, another thing that I learned from Dr. Martin Luther King, this idea of mutuality. All men are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garden of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. I can never be what I ought to be until you are what you ought to be, and you can never be what you ought to be until I am what I ought to be. I really don't think that we collectively can achieve authentic community, authentic relationship, without this concept of mutuality, without all of us being what we ought to be for each other. We are inextricably bound to one another. We were created for relationship with one another. And we need those relationships to understand and to realize our full selves. I shared a, a little bit about how this has changed us personally. Uh, but it's also completely changed our professional lives, right? Like my wife is a different kind of teacher because of her knowledge and connection to our friends and neighbors. Uh, as the city's health director and subsequently now as the, as the state uh, department of services, social services commissioner, like I approach my job with a different level of insight and understanding and advocacy for the people in my life that are being subjected to these systems that don't work. I, I think that that reality, that we operate differently because of these relationships, is, is part of achieving that authentic community. Uh, I want to make this a little bit more practical. Uh, this is a picture of Anchorage, Alaska. And uh, Anchorage is a beautiful city. I actually was out there in 2011, one of my favorite vacations of my life. Uh, and in 2018, a, a magnitude 7.1 earthquake rocked this city. Uh, and so as city leaders were turning to try to figure out how, well, how do we respond, how do we keep our residents safe, uh, they knew it was going to be really important to reach this community of, of new, uh, new people in, in Anchorage, this growing community of new Alaskans, either refugees or, or uh, indigenous people who were moving into the city. Um, and, and fortunately, the city had actually spent a lot of time investing in and building relationships in that immigrant and refugee community. They devoted a lot of time and energy and money into translating resources, interpreting key documents. Uh, and as a result, they were, they were really able to get the message out to all, all of these different sectors of their community. Um, and the first lady of, of the city, the, the, the mayor of the wife, uh, said this, the earthquake demonstrated how critical it is that all of us know that we can rely on each other during times of shock and stress. This resilience is important for our city, and our success requires creating an inclusive culture and an equitable community. During and after the quake, we were able to quickly communicate with all of our resi residents 
keeping people safe. And then a commentator about this experience wrote this, in a hyper-polarized environment, developing trust among neighbors and ensuring that all residents feel at home and are able to fully participate in their communities is critical. In communities with a growing immigrant and refugee population, the task of managing demographic change so that all residents feel included can often be a daunting one. But fortunately, cities like Anchorage and many more around the country are demonstrated that the work of building a welcoming environment is not only possible, but it's in the self-interest of all residents who want to live in safer and more economically vibrant communities. We heard Telly speak to this just a, about an hour ago. We are clearly in a hyper-polarized environment right now, right? I mean, this is not a, a political statement. I, I have uh, I've served under both a Democratic and a Republican governor. I have deep respect for people on, on all sides of the aisle. Um, but I, I think you all will agree that where we are right now uh, is, is different than where we have been historically. Um, one, one example of that, you know, Obama ran on this sort of core idea of change, uh, this idea that things need to get better, and you know who really glommed onto that were black and brown people across this country, the idea that things need to change, uh, and, and it's a huge part of why he uh, was elected twice. Uh, President Trump, one, the, the core message that, that really resonated with his constituency was Let's, let's get America the way it used to be. Let's make America great again. And, and that lost a lot of the minority voters, right? Because they were like, we don't, we don't want that anymore. Um, and, and so I, I think that just that concept, the theme of what resonated during these two different administrations uh, is, a, is a picture of uh, where people are at and an example of what has further polarized our community. And I think we've got to pay attention to this because the demographics, you, you probably thought a lot about this as, as movers and shakers in this community, um, we are getting more minority. As a nation, we crossed that threshold a couple years ago where more than 50% of babies are born uh, are not white. Um, and in every community, we are seeing the racial trends move in this direction. And so, uh, you know, I think both for the relational aspects of of forging authentic community, but also for the practical aspects of, of building a vibrant and thriving economy, we've, we've got to figure out how to bridge the gap. So how do we do that? Uh, three short thoughts, and then we will move to our panel. Uh, one, start by listening. Like what you guys are doing here today, having people uh, who represent different communities up here uh, asking questions, but I think we also need to do that out in communities, right? We need to go uh, to where our immigrant communities are. We need to talk to the front lines of, of our residents and understand what would it take for people to feel more connected, to feel more welcome, to feel more invited to tables. Uh, so we just need to make that a part of our practice. We need to create opportunities to serve together. You know that story I told about those UVA kids going down to Jackson, Mississippi, doesn't just work for college kids. I mean, we have so many examples of where adults in communities uh, do service projects. They uh, engage in uh, cleanups, they do volunteer efforts, they invest in art together. Uh, but the opportunity to serve community together can be a huge bridge builder for different sectors of the community. And then as someone who has spent too many years in government, uh, institutionalizing that effort. You know, anytime we want to say, hey, it's important for us to be a welcoming community, it's important for us to be the kind of community that is uh, that for all people, that's got to be reflected in our policy, in our mission and vision statements, uh, in our practices as institutions. And so uh, I think an evidence of the Martinsville Hunter County community moving in this direction would be seeing this priority pop up in public and private sector documents uh, and, and, and seeing that institutionalization of a commitment to this work. Uh, last month, I was at a bar mitzvah. It was the first bar mitzvah I've ever uh, I've been to since I was 13 years old. Uh, this is me and, and my dear friends. Their son was the one who was in 13. You can see me in the bottom right there. I don't know that I've ever been happier than the chair dance right here. Um, but one of the things that came up in the, in the kind of sermon at the bar mitzvah uh, was this idea that the word shalom. You guys have probably heard that word, and, and I've always thought that the word shalom, uh, so it's sort of this literal trans translation of the English word peace. 
Um, but in the unpacking of this word, I learned that it is a much more complex concept, that the Hebrew word shalom speaks to a deeper, richer, and more holistic understanding of peace. Soundness, intactness, safety, completeness, well-being, flourishing, wholeness. All of these are words that describe the shalom of a community. And, and we have talked about here this morning that, that these, uh, these values can't be achieved without the pursuit of mutual relationships. So I'll close with this thought, that we are at this real crossroads as a nation and as Martinsville and Henry County. And now more than ever, we need to pursue authentic relationships, relationships of mutuality, and we need to commit to a vision of shalom for our community. And I've just heard so many of you voice that today. Uh, and so I'm really excited about where Martinsville Henry County is heading as you all pursue the shalom of this community. All right, so let's invite our, our uh, panel up and we will talk about. Questions first. Oh, questions first. All right. <coughs> questions. It's a hard thing for a bunch of executives at a business to sort of think about this in their vacuum without inviting you know, other folks in the organization who are actually impacted by a community that may not be as inclusive as you want it to be. So that would be the first thing that like, let's think about who the voices are that need to be a part of the conversation and make sure that they're there and that it's a safe space for them uh, to, to connect. Um, the second would be that a little bit more of a complicated one, but this idea that that uh, you know investments in in diversity and equity aren't a zero sum game, right? It's not that uh, improving things for African Americans in your business means making things worse for uh, Asians in your business, right? But that improving things for one segment often actually is better for everybody. And I, I think about practical examples like. Um, uh, one that comes up in planning a lot is the is is curb cutouts in a community, and uh, you know the disability community advocates for that a lot, so that people in wheelchairs can can get up and down in sidewalks. Uh, but it turns out when you do that, that works really well for little kids on bikes or moms and dads with strollers, and it's actually a a, a better uh, amenity for all people. So I think getting away from that idea that, that only one group wins when you're doing DEI, but that DEI is actually good for everybody. Yeah, I think do you have any advice for someone as a, like a young minority professional who is in spaces like these um, where you can say things without offending certain people, not just on one side, but also how to get your people to care and become more involved without offending them as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think Getting to a place where things are not offensive like has to be grounded in relationship. And so I, I think, you know, I think sometimes you've, you've got to uh, figure out 
what, how, how do I say this? Um, I, I think there's just gotta be a grounding, groundedness of relationship to a point where people can hear hard things, right? Because I think we've all been in situations where we should be able to say things and they're received the wrong way and because of the power dynamics that exist in communities, that, that sucks for people like you, right? And so I think that um, if this is not a satisfactory answer because like the, my, my real answer would be that we should all be at a place where we can hear those things and that we can love and respect and have mutual admiration for each other, even if we don't agree, but we can at least be on a learning journey together. But that's, that's not where we're at. And so I do feel like the more people can uh, find spaces to, to learn each other's stories, to, to, I mean, a lot of times when I see it, it's when, um, you know, like, people have played on sports teams together, and they've had, like, the serving together, or playing together, or working together to build a relationship, that then opens the door to the kind of conversations that you're talking about. But the conversations you're talking about have to happen for a community. Yeah. Good evening, thank you for your testimony. Um, probably a limited time where diversity and inclusion and equity um, have become checkbox words. So, what would you consider adequate proof uh, that besides just hiring a quote of people or making sure you have one or two people inside of a conversation, what would you consider the litmus test for, for real diversity in equity. I think as a public health doc, that it is a, um, that is a reality that is decades in the making. And, and the answer to your question is, I would see a community where there is the opportunity for everybody to have access to wealth, to health, to well-being, uh, and that's not the case right now. I mean, every social outcome you look at, if you stratify by race, there are major gaps between black and white communities. And until that goes away, we're, we're still checking boxes, you know? So, uh, but we also have to recognize that like, we didn't get here overnight, right? It took 400 years of this country's history to sort of create the situation that we're in. Uh, and hopefully it doesn't take us 400 years to get out, but it will be a, a, you know, a couple generations of uh, of, of shifting power, of, of creating opportunities for wealth, of uh, you know creating the kinds of communities where people do have the opportunity to be healthy. Thank you. 